Good evening and thank you for coming. My name is Amelia Irvin and I'm a junior in the college from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm the president of Love Saxa, a group that defends healthy relationships and traditional marriage, and the co-president of the Network of Enlightened Women, a conservative women's group. I've attended loads of GU politics events, and I'm so excited to see them reaching across the aisle to host a wonderful pro-life Republican like Senator Jeff Flake. Please use the hashtag Flake at GU to engage online with tonight's event. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Mo Alethi, the founding executive director of GU politics. Before launching the Institute in 2015, Mo spent two decades as one of the top communications strategists in the Democratic Party, most recently as communications director and chief spokesman of the Democratic National Committee. A Clinton campaign alumnus, Mo Lathy is a graduate of Georgetown's own School of Foreign Service. Our guest of honor tonight is Senator Jeff Flake. Senator Flake is a fifth generation Arizonan who was raised on a cattle ranch in Snowflake, Arizona. Prior to his election to the U.S. Senate, Senator Flake served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 2001 to 2013, representing the East Valley. As a member of the U.S. Senate, Senator Flake sits on the Judiciary Committee, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and the Foreign Relations Committee. After serving a Mormon mission in Southern Africa, Senator Flake graduated from BYU, Brigham Young University, where he received a BA in International Relations and an MA in Political Science. In 1987, he started his career at a Washington, D.C. public affairs firm, but soon returned to Africa as executive director of the Foundation for Democracy. In 1992, Senator Flake was named executive director of the Goldwater Institute. He recently wrote a book titled Conscience of a Conservative, echoing the seminal work of late conservative hero Barry Goldwater. Senator Flake and his wife live in Mesa and have five children. Please join me in welcoming Mo Lathy and Senator Jeff Flake. Amelia, thank you very much for the introduction. And Senator, I got to tell you, I'm, it's a, it, I'm very excited tonight. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Uh, we had an all Arizona warm up here. Uh, Amelia is from Arizona, and I'm from Arizona. So, and while I come from the uh, opposite side of the aisle, um, uh, I, I always um, uh, enjoy sharing the stage. I didn't with know you. Arizona had any of those. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the percentage went down when I came to Georgia. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so I want to just have a conversation tonight, um, hopefully a short one between the two of us, okay. and then allow you to have a conversation with the students here, um, on the theme of your book. Okay. Um, uh, it's been getting a lot of attention uh, since you released it, um, in which you really sort of ask some tough questions and make some tough points about the <clears throat> conservative movement that defined your own political career. And so before we get into the meat of it, or I guess this really is kind of the meat of it, I want to ask to kick us off, if you wouldn't mind just defining what it means to be a conservative from your perspective. Well, Barry Goldwater defined a conservative as uh, somebody who believed in the maximum amount of freedom consistent with order. Uh, I think that's, that's a pretty good definition. If you uh, believe, uh, obviously, that we want to uphold uh, America's traditions and values um, in a way that uh, they can be passed on to our posterity, uh, take what is best of our past and our history and perpetuate that in the future. Obviously, a, a, another definition is one who believes in limited government, economic freedom, individual responsibility, and I would add to that uh, free trade, free enterprise internationally, and, uh, and is pro-immigration as well, although that has uh, changed a little more recently in terms of uh, what many of our party's adherents believe in. Uh, I think your point is a good one. I, when I was in democratic politics, I always would sort of, uh, in messaging meetings, talk about how Republicans, it's interesting, if you ask 10 Republicans why they're a Republican or 10 conservatives why they're a conservative, you would get some sort of, it would come back to smaller government, right. limited government. Yep. It might have an evangelical flavor <laughs> to it or a, or a Wall Street flavor to it or a libertarian, but it would get back to that. But in your book, you talk quite a bit about how uh, the conservative label has been right. preempted in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, um, not just within the Republican Party, but 
conservatives themselves, people who identify as conservatives right. themselves, sort of abandoning that core that mm -hmm. you talk about. How did that happen? I think it, it, it's happened over time. I, I got elected first in uh, 2000, well, yeah, the year 2000, for, and so came to Washington January 2001. It was uh, at the same time that George W. Bush was elected. It was just after the contract with America and all the excitement of the 1990s when Republicans really, uh, I think, um, decided, you know, here's, here's a contract with America. Here are the principles that we believe in. And it was a heady time. Uh, during the 1990s, I was running the Goldwater Institute. And we would look at what was going on in Washington and think, boy, it would be great to be there to, to see this conservative movement gaining steam. Uh, I was running a think tank in Arizona. Mike Pence was running a think tank in Indiana. We knew each other then. We were elected at the same time. And I distinctly remember sitting at the State of the Union address uh, where President Bush was, uh, was talking. I think that was the first one. And he started outlining all these uh, big government programs. <laughs> there was a $750 million Office of Compassion or something like that. And Mike and I were looking at each other. And, I still remember Mike uh, was we were just kind of slow clapping. He, Mike said, uh, just because I'm a clapping for it doesn't mean I'm a voting for it. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but we, we remarked to ourselves that we, we felt like we'd kind of uh, been, we were Minuteman called up to the battlefield only to find out when we got there the war was over. And, and over the next several years, I, I couldn't help but get that feeling that Republicans, we'd kind of, are the intellectual part of republicanism or conservatism had kind of been spent. And we decided just to do things like no child left behind, you know, more federal government in, involvement in local education, which is really kind of stands against conservative principles. And then the prescription drug benefit where we added about, you know, oh, how many trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities uh, for our future and uh, things like that. that and then the, the big spending that came with earmarks and the corruption that came there. And, uh, and then we lost the majorities in the House, the Senate, and the White House, and lost the, the White House as well in 2008. And, and I have to say we deserved it as, as conservatives because we didn't stick to the, the main major tenet, I think, of conservatism, which is smaller government or limited government. Um, and, and so I, I think... You know, some people look at the book and say this is just a, a treatise on, on Trump or Trumpism. It, it's not. It, that's part of it. But I think Republicans, we'd lost our way long before that. And there was one particular time I remember, and I wrote about it in the book, that I, I, I knew that we were in trouble as Republicans and we had lost the intellectual firepower we once had, is when uh, we brought, you know, bills to the floor to, do, to talk about flag burning and to outlaw flag burning. I've always thought the best reason not to burn a flag is the fact that you can and, uh, and we shouldn't go that direction. But then, you know, the whole Terry Schiavo issue and whatever else, we, we, uh, we got away from limited government and because we couldn't claim that we were the party of limited government, then we had to, to wage some of the cultural wars. And that, that's, that never goes well for a party when you have to do that. And I see some of those same things going on today. The arguments about is somebody kneeling, you know, for the national anthem. Those things are important, but in place of, you know, what ought to be the arguments that we need to have in Washington. Yeah. The word populism is thrown around right. a lot is in today's political environment. You talk about it in your book. Um, I, I kind of have a theory that that where we are today, I agree with you, it's not new, right? This didn't mm -hmm. come along with President Trump. President Trump kind of stepped into, stepped onto the field right. at a time when the political conversation outside of Washington was shifting from left versus right to up versus down. Mm -hmm. That people were feeling disconnected from the core institutions that were set up to serve them, not just government, but Wall Street, mm -hmm. the media, Across the board, with the exception of the military, people had lost trust in our institutions. You talk about conservatives moving away from that limited government argument. 
But was there anything deeper or some, do you think that would have been enough to deal with that erosion of trust that we are seeing across all the institutions? I don't know. I mean, uh, populism is called populism for a reason. It's popular. <laughs> you, you can, you know, a candidate can identify, uh, you know, issues that you're having, mistrust uh, um, that uh, the constituents have in their government um, or their representatives. And, and I think uh, Donald Trump, um, you know, addressed that in a, in a very, uh, you know, effective way. Uh, the problem is you've got to govern in the end. And if you can't govern, uh, then people are just even more cynical of government. And, you know, you, you can't, uh, you can't go on, you, know, you can't govern with the politics of resentment. And a lot of what we've seen with this populism is the politics of resentment. So I, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the direction that we're going in. Mm -hmm. and let me take my watch off. It seems to be beeping. I'll throw it to my <laughs> wife here. <laughs> there. <laughs> nice catch. <laughs> Mrs. Swank, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I read a recent article, I think from last fall, uh, and the lead was Jeff Flake was Tea Party before Tea Party was cool. Um, that as you were sort of on this coming up through politics at the federal level, mm -hmm. you were known as this fiscal conservative reformer, a little bit of a thorn in the side of party leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess one I would ask, would you identify yourself with the Tea Party, particularly as you were coming up and now? And secondly, what would you say to those who might argue that the Tea Party sort of conditioned the environment that allowed President Trump mm -hmm. to ascend? I think the last part of that, I think that's somewhat true. Um, as to whether or not I'm a, a Tea Partier, I never considered myself that. I, I've just always been cheap. My wife will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I've, I've always thought that government ought to live within its means. and. And what really uh, I, I was just shocked at when I got here was the waste and inefficiency. And, and, and not just that, but the earmarking culture that we had. In, in 2005, we had 16,000 earmarks spread across you know, 12 appropriation bills and one authorization bill, spending about uh, $28 billion. Uh, a couple of our colleagues ended up in jail because of corruption that attached itself to it. And a lot of my time in the House was spent going to the House floor and challenging these spending projects and uh, not being very successful at <laughs> doing that. And all the time, going to the floor hundreds and hundreds of times, the, the, in fact, it came to be called the, the flake hour. At the end of every appropriation bill, we had an open rule so my leadership couldn't stop me from doing it. And I would just try to cut money for the, you know, the teapot museum or the bridge to nowhere or things like this. And, and uh, my colleagues would stick together to protect each other's earmarks. And so in all that time, the several hundred projects I challenged, I won only one, uh, only one. It was the perfect Christmas tree project. It was subsidies for Christmas tree ornaments in North Carolina or something. Uh, and it was uh, sponsored by, uh, this earmark was sponsored by a, a Republican that the Dem Democrats could not stand. In fact, they hated this Republican more than they liked their own earmarks, and so they voted it down. Uh, but what happened over time is, uh, you know, corruption came in, and, and uh, it just finally neither party could defend earmarks anymore, and they went away. But uh, I think that the Tea Party really started there with fiscal responsibility. And when Obamacare came along, that was seen as something that was not only uh, taking too much freedom from Americans, but also something that uh, would put us on a fiscally unsustainable path. And that was, that was kind of the beginning, the origin of the Tea Party movement. But then it kind of drifted off. Um, and I, I was there for the fiscal part of it. But then it drifted off, in Arizona at least, toward anti-immigration and, and uh, some of the cultural issues. And, and that's where I, I couldn't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up on a, on a cattle ranch and a, a farm, a small town. Yes, it is Snowflake, Arizona. I am a flake from Snowflake. <laughs> my my great-great-grandfather founded the town. Uh, and somebody named Snow came along. And even in Arizona, mm -hmm. there's Snowflake that way. But, uh, <laughs> But I, I grew up on, on a ranch, and we used migrant labor, some of it illegal labor that came in. It wasn't illegal at that point, I should say, to hire it when I was growing up. 
uh, or hire migrants coming across, but I got to know these migrants. I, I knew why they were coming, what their motivation was, and I, I've never been able to look at them and see a criminal class. And so that's where I parted ways, particularly when Arizona was really getting ginned up with SB 1070 and all these laws that uh, targeted immigrants. And, uh, and that's where I think the party is really, we have to correct. Because uh, if, if I think as a Republican, as, as a conservative, that, that immigrants and minorities uh, should gravitate toward our party. You know, it's up by the bootstraps. It's, it's uh, you know, entrepreneurship, ingenuity. And that's what most immigrants, you know, that's why they came for a better life. Uh, but if we are seen as a party that is not friendly toward immigrants, if we uh, stand, you know, and, and push off DACA kids, for example, um, you just don't ever get to have the conversation that you need to have to say, hey, you ought to be with our party. And that's really concerning to me. And when, when we had the so-called autopsy after the Mitt Romney lost, uh, I, I thought that you know, that was necessary and proper, and I agreed with it, that we've got to, as a party, appeal to a broader electorate. Um, and then that lasted about uh, a month, and then a populist <laughs> rose up and everybody chased him. It's really and interesting. So. You, you, you write very compellingly in your book about your experience on the ranch and how that helped shape your right. views on immigration. You also write very compellingly about um, growing up as a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints and the persecution a lot of people in your faith uh, have faced and how that shaped your perception and your approach and your thinking on the proposed Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. um, and both of those things in a lot of ways, the way they're manifesting themselves politically seem to me to be feeding into this great otherization yep. in our politics. Um, and, you know, it's easy in the simplistic back and forth of politics for a lot of people on my side of the aisle to just paint this wide brush, conservatives are racist or conservatives are bigoted. Or, But I'd love to hear you make, and, and you touched on it a little bit with immigration, but more broadly, the conservative argument to that, pushing back on this sort of otherization of our right. politics. Well, every, every few decades, we kind of go through uh, these spasms where we're anti-immigrant. I, I think it's felt not just by one party, but as a country, you know, it was against the Irish at one point or against another group. Uh, um, it, it, the groups change, but the feelings, uh, you know, are, are the same. And, you know, you mentioned my, my faith. I'm, I'm LDS. The LDS church was persecuted. Uh, in fact, in Snowflake, uh, my great-great-grandfather founded the town in the 1870s. By the 1890s, the, the Mormon church was concerned, the church leadership, that there would be too many Mormons in one party or another, and then if the administration came in and it was the other party, then it wouldn't, the church might be persecuted again. And so they went through congregations in southern Utah and Arizona and basically said, we need more representation in both parties, so if you're sitting in the left pews today, you're going to be Democrats in the future. <laughs> the right views or vice versa, you're Republicans. In Snowflake, where I grew up, it was uh, Main Street was a divider. If you lived west of Main Street, you were to be a Democrat. And uh, east of Main Street, or, uh, I'm sorry, Republican, east of Main Street, Democrats. And the Flakes lived mostly east of uh, Main Street. And so it held for a few generations. My father uh, was born a Democrat uh, until he was courting my mother, who. Finally, after a while, she said, I think you, you identify you know, more with Republicans. He said, okay. And so he switched. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but when you grow up in a small town, um, it's, it's different. Um, you, you, and I, my mother, after my father passed away this, this summer, he's 85 years old, um, she gave me, uh, after the funeral, a plaque that was given to him by the Snowflake City Council, which I have proudly on my wall after he served a term as mayor of Snowflake. It kind of comes by rotation for flakes there, I think. Uh, but, uh, but, but it was, and it's just a continual reminder to me that, that politics doesn't have to be vitriolic. Um, I have an uncle, you're gonna laugh, but Jake Flake from Snowflake. Uh, he was Speaker of the House in Arizona um, for a long period of time when I just came to Congress. And, uh, and he, 
uh, th th this, you know, rural Arizona is just not partisan. It can be more Democrat or Republican, but it's just not vitriolic. And, and that's what uh, I think we've got to see more of here. And with regard to the, the, the Muslim ban, when Donald Trump mentioned in December of 15 that there should be a ban on all Muslims, I, I was so incensed by it that I went that weekend to a mosque and, and spoke uh, about Mormons and Muslims and talking about uh, you know, our, our common interests and why we shouldn't, uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, ban any group. And, uh, and I, 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 just, I just think that as a party, if we continue to go down, down that direction, it's just, it's, you're just writing your, your obituary as a party, I think. You we're going into irrelevance if we continue to, more as Republicans than Democrats right now, uh, shun different groups, particularly immigrant groups. A lot of self-described conservatives who may not love this president kind of hold their nose and say, well, President Trump is giving us what we want. We're getting conservative judges. We got tax reform, an issue that's been near and dear to your heart. Um, and I looked at a recent study that said that you, in fact, vote with him about 90% of the time. A lot of people on my side will hear you speak out uh, and then say, yeah, but you're not putting your money where your mouth is. And I'm wondering how you reconcile your voting record, which right. is very much aligned with a lot of the president's positions, with some of the things that, some of your concerns. Right. Okay. Well, first, I'm a conservative, um, and I will vote for judges. I thought Neil Gorsuch was a stellar pick. I still do. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the judges that have come up through, sometimes, and it's, the voting record on the floor is a bit misleading because oftentimes the president will float a name out there or come to us and say, we want to nominate this person. And we'll say, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and so it, it doesn't make its uh, way right. through. And some cabinet picks or sub-cabinet picks are the same way. And so it just doesn't come to the floor. Um, but, but also, I've always had a philosophy that a president ought to get his or her people uh, unless they're just not qualified. And that's why when Barack Obama was president, even though I'm a conservative and uh, um, uh, you know, Attorney General Lynch was not a conservative, I voted for her because she was qualified and the president deserves his person. And I've, I've felt that way and, and I, I will vote and I have voted against a few and will continue, hopefully, during the process, say, don't name this person or don't take right. this person through the committee. Uh, but, uh, but with regard to things like uh, health care, I had voted some 40 times to repeal and replace Obamacare before the president came and agreed with our position. Um, I, I wasn't going to change my vote just because of disagreements I have with the president on other things. And the same with tax reform. Um, I, I think that I, my role as a senator should be to vote with the president when I think he's right and vote against him when I think he's wrong and try to convince him on the other things. And so I think that's where I've been. Okay. I have a lot more questions, but they're not gonna be nearly as good as the questions that come <laughs> from the students. So we're gonna move to questions from the audience. Um, we've got a couple people walking around with microphones, so raise your hand, they'll come to you. Uh, and then I may intersperse a few uh, along the way. So let's start on this side of the room. Who's got the microphone? All right. First off, Senator Flake, I'd like to thank you for coming and speaking with us, um, and also thank you for the speech you gave last week defending our First Amendment right. Um, but uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, as you, you said, you're a proponent of individual responsibility, and you're a proponent of small government, less government interference in people's lives. And I just want to be able to understand sort of where you reconcile that with the pro-life stance mm -hmm. and how that comes across. Um, in general, because that's sort of one of the hard line conservative values that I've never been able to understand personally, right. um, since it seems that you don't want that government interference within the individual life. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, and that's a good question. That's uh, one debate that has been around for a long time, and I suppose will be around for a, a, a long time as well. As, as conservatives and as Republicans, we believe 
in protecting individual rights. And the difference, I guess, with uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it's not, there's not a clean break, but in general, or conservatives and liberals, is just um, who's, whose rights are preeminent. Is it the, the rights of an unborn child or the rights of, of the mother, and at what point those rights can be asserted? And so I think that uh, people of goodwill can disagree on that and uh, continue to debate that. Um, or t today there was a, a, a vote that we just had in the Senate, cloture vote on the pain-capable bill, which uh, you know every country in the world, not just in the US, we struggle with that. I think seven countries uh, um, allow uh, abortion at any stage. Uh, the rest of the world, we're among one of those seven countries, and the rest of the world has some restrictions as to at what term uh, abortions would be allowed. And so I think it uh, depends on, on your own um, philosophy or faith or, or, uh, or beliefs, but I think people of goodwill can disagree on things like that. I respect those who say, uh, you just respect the, 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 the rights of the mother at any stage, but I also respect those and uh, tend to share more the view of those who say there ought to be at some point where you take into account uh, you know, the, the, the life of that child. She referenced uh, the speech that you gave on the Senate floor, right. um, uh, I guess a week or two ago. The press has long been a foil for Republicans, and many conservatives have talked about uh, perceived media bias against conservatives, against Republicans. You gave a very forceful defense, though, of the press in that speech. And I just was wondering if you walk us through that thought right. process, what compelled, what, why you felt compelled to do so. Well, I, I, I mean, as a conservative, I think uh, the, the media, the mainstream media, or the lamestream media, or whatever <laughs> uh, you, you want to call it. Um, it. I mean, as a conservative, there there is, generally a bias. I, I accept that, but, uh, but you accept that and you move on. Um, and and I, what, what concerns me is if people in a position like I have or the president has to say, well, all right, this is fake news, this is not, and by the way, I can deny media companies licenses or I, I'm in a position to restrict the kind of speech that I don't like or that I think is fake news. And, and I just, I don't like that. And I mentioned, I, I, I think it's awful uh, to have the President of the United States uh, not understand history well enough to know that you don't use, you shouldn't use a term like enemy of the people uh, that was most famously used by some people that uh, we don't want to emulate. Um, and, and uh, people were saying, oh, you're comparing Trump to Stalin. I, I wasn't really. I was just saying a president of the United States um, is not like Stalin. He murdered millions of people. Therefore, we shouldn't borrow his language, a language that is so loaded like that. And then the flip side of that is around the world, we've seen example after example after example of authoritarians and despots borrowing now the term fake news as justification to jail their opponents. Uh, right now there are 262 journalists jailed around the world. That's a record. Um, some 21 are jailed on what are called false news charges, uh, which echo in a bad way uh, what's been saying. And so that's what the speech was about. We have to be careful about what we say. It matters, words matter, uh, particularly for journalists around the world and, and I don't want a chilling effect on, on our press here as well. Um, I, uh, like I say, I, I'm not suggesting that all press is unbiased, it's not, uh, but people in my position shouldn't be, that have the authority to actually impact what speech is heard and what is not, uh, we shouldn't be saying those kind of things and shouldn't be labeling things fake news that we know are not uh, or vice versa. Okay, let's take a question from this side. Hi, Senator Flake. Victor Gamas from Nogales, Arizona. Great. Um, and I wanted to ask you about free trade. Uh, last week in Davos, President Trump gave a friendly stance on the TPP and NAFTA, friendlier than usual. Um, and I wanted to ask you, 
where do you see NAFTA renegotiations heading? Um, the possibility of U.S. entering the TPP in the future, um, and the impact of a termination of those agreements um, on a state like Arizona and a city like Nogales. Okay. Well, thank you. And Nogales is right on on the border and benefits significantly from cross-border trade. In fact, uh, Mexican shoppers spend eight million dollars a day in Arizona. Um, just cross-border. Shopping Arizona trades with Mexico. It's about a fifteen billion dollar cross-border trade item this this year. Um, NAFTA has been wonderful uh, for Mexico, for Canada, and the United States. And where I differ with the president is he seems to see trade as a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses, and fixates on trade deficits um, in an unhealthy way. Uh, trade deficits rarely matter that much. In some cases, they really don't matter. And um, I, I, I'm very concerned about where the, the, the president and the administration is on trade overall. It was a big mistake uh, for us to exit the TPP or Trans-Pacific Partnership. We ought to be concerned about China and uh, their, what, how they're projecting um, and gaining steam um, around the world in trade relative to, to where we are and we gave the biggest gift we could give to China by exiting the TPP and allowing countries in Southeast Asia that really would rather be in our trade orbit, at least partly. And now they have no other choice. And now Canada and most of the TPP countries are moving ahead without us. That's, that's really dangerous. Overall, my view on trade is we are less than 5% of the world's population in this country. We are 20% of the world's economic output and shrinking. Not because we're shrinking, but the developing world is growing faster. If we don't trade, we don't grow. And it's as simple as that. We've got to find new markets for our goods. And whenever we've had experience in the past, whether it's Smoot Holly or other examples of uh, protectionist barriers, uh, it hasn't ended well. And particularly today, where where labor and capital is so mobile, uh, we can't afford to, to say, all right, we're just not gonna participate. Um, and the tariffs uh, announced last week on solar panels and washing machines, uh, just a big mistake. Uh, no justification in terms of, of anti-competitive behavior or dumping, it was just some companies here wanting protection from competition. And that is something Republicans and conservatives in particular ought to stand up and say, uh, we can't go there. I'm very concerned about NAFTA in that the president has said that uh, you know, maybe we can get a better deal if we exit and then renegotiate over the next six months. Uh, those of us who've been down in Mexico City and have talked to the Canadians and whatever else, they're not waiting. Um, and we're losing contracts now as we speak because of uncertainty and these countries worried that we're not going to be a reliable trade partner in the future. And so I, it's, it's very concerning. And uh, I, I think that the president, and I commend the president on helping Congress and for all of us to put in place a more conducive tax and regulatory environment so that we can compete uh, globally. But if we don't aggressively work for multilateral trade deals, bilateral, any trail that we can get, then we're going to be left behind. Let's go to this side of the room. Uh, could you tell us your views on how the nomination of Merrick Garland was uh, handled in the Senate? Well, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I've met Merrick Garland, <laughs> and uh, I, th I think he would have been a good Supreme Court justice. I, I do. Um, I do, though, uh, when you look over history, um, you would have to go back to, I think, 1888 to find an example of where the president in one party nominated somebody and the opposition party in the Senate and the House, or the Senate actually moved that nomination through in the last year of a president's term. Uh, so it was, uh, you can call it whatever, but it wasn't unprecedented. Uh, this was uh, more following precedent than not. Uh, but uh, I, 
I do think that uh, he would have made a Supreme Court justice. In my view, I'm a conservative and a Republican. I, I think that Neil Gorsuch is more closely aligned with my philosophy. Uh, but I do think uh, that, and I wrote in my book, it, it is concerning that does that, you know, add to the, the intransigence and uh, the non-cooperation, the partisanship that we approach these nominations with. And if it does, then it may not have been worth it in the end uh, because uh, uh, it's this, we've got to get away from this. Um, prior to 2003, nobody ever um, filibustered a court pick with the exception of Abe Fordus back in 1973, which is a different kind of case. You just didn't do it. Um, those of us who were, I wasn't in Congress, but I watched closely the Bork hearings and uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, those were extremely controversial court picks by presidents. And they both got uh, votes in the Senate. Nobody would have thought at that time to filibuster. You just didn't do it. And now it's just where you go until the rules were changed to go back to basically where it was before, where nobody can yeah. uh, filibuster. And I just wonder where it goes from here and how much further we delve into just the, the bouncing back and forth between party extremes every two years or every four years. And I am very concerned about uh, the vanishing middle in, in politics. Um, yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit. The, the McCord School of Public Policy, our, our parent school, partners with the Luger Center to do a bipartisan index. Right. Uh, of the 240 senators that they have ranked going back to the 203rd Congress, um, you are ranked the 203rd out of 240th um, most partisan senator. At the same time, and we were talking backstage, you forge relationships with Democrats like Tim Kaine. You famously uh, 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 went to a deserted island <laughs> with Democratic Senator Martin Heinrich from, from New Mexico. Um, and I guess my question is, how do you thread that needle? How do you stay true to your, your conservative ideals and beliefs and your partisan perspective right. while working with Democrats like Tim, Crane, Tim Kaine and Martin Heinrich? And at a time when we just seem so polarized, can we put the genie back in the bottle? Can we get back to, to some sort of working together? I don't know. It, it, it struck me the other day how, um, you know, the vanishing middle really struck me when I, I took a, a group from Arizona. They were in the Capitol, and they wanted to see, go see the House. And, you know, once you're in the Senate, you never want to go back to the House. But uh, I right. thought, all right, I'll go back over there. <laughs> we're, we're snobbish that way. We have to go over there for the State of the Union yeah, address tomorrow. Done. That's about yeah, all we check. can take. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, but I, I seriously, I loved the House and loved my time there. But uh, <laughs> but but I went I went over there and I was giving this tour and and I was telling people that uh, and they're always surprised that they would say, well, where was your seat? Uh, and I said, there are no assigned seats in the, in the House. There are some, you know, 450 seats, but none of them are assigned. But I, I said, I always point out, but people tend to congregate around the same place. You know, up in the corner was John Murtha's corner. He was the appropriator. And he had a corner seat so people could come and beg and kneel for their earmarks. And, uh, you know, and then there was uh, the Hispanic caucuses in a certain place. They're all, they all go around the same place. And then I was pointing out the blue dog Democrats sit, those are the centrist Democrats, sit near the center aisle, symbolically. Um, and, and it used to be there was a big crowd there. And as election time would come closer, they'd get even closer to the center. <laughs> but, uh, but, but then I, I started to try to name blue dog Democrats uh, that are left in the House. And I had to stop at about three or four. It just gone. And the same with Republicans who vote across the aisle. You always had a time where there were a lot of conservative Democrats, more conservative than the most liberal Republicans, and now you just don't have many crossover. And that is dangerous, and I think it's not consistent with, you know, getting conservative policy done, because the more we are at loggerheads like this, the more power we cede to the administration. 
And uh, the more we kind of bat back and forth um, on policy, but I think the less conservative policy as well. Um, and certainly not, it's not healthy to cede more power to the administration every year. But uh, as you mentioned, I, I, I felt it was so such a problem that a couple of years ago, I thought uh, we've got to prove that Republicans and Democrats can get along. And so Martin Heinrich and I were elected to the Senate at the same time. We were both in the House. He's a, a more of a liberal Democrat from New Mexico, border state. We'd worked on a few public lands issues together. And, and uh, Martin uh, is a sportsman and a hunter and a real outdoorsman. And I was showing him pictures. I'd been to an island to do a little survival trip by myself and then with our two youngest kids before. But I was showing him pictures of you know, spearing fish and, and whatnot for our meal. And, uh, and he started to pull out pictures of the fish that he'd speared in Hawaii. And I thought, those are bigger than the ones I did. <laughs> this guy could be useful. And uh, so, so after a whole long evening, uh, we were at a votorama where we'd vote on amendments every couple of minutes all night long. And we, uh, we talked and talked and decided that we were going to go back to the Marshall Islands in the middle of the Pacific, halfway between Hawaii and Australia, and uh, you know, just land on an island and see if we could survive together, the two of us, with no food or water. And, you think it's crazy, it, you're right, <laughs> but, but, uh, but we did it. Um, but before we went, we went to uh, Discovery Channel and said, uh, would you want to come, or we, we'll take a GoPro and bring the footage back. You have a lot of survival shows, you know, maybe like this. And, and uh, they said, no, we, we want to come uh, and film it. And so, so they did. This was not naked and afraid, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> <laughs> afraid, yes. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we wrote a contract on the naked part, but, but uh, we got to the Marshall Islands. They had us pick a couple of items. We each had a swim mask, and, uh, and we had, uh, that was it, basically. Um, nothing to start a fire, and both Martin and I were very adept in our backyards in Arizona and New Mexico at lighting fires with sticks. I could get a water bottle like this and use it as a magnifying glass and start a fire. I mean, I was good. So was he. You get to the island and nothing works. <laughs> so we, uh, we ate raw clam and raw fish for a week, but a full week without food or water. And it was a sobering experience, but uh, it was awesome. You can still get it on Amazon, $2.99, <laughs> called Rival Survival. But, uh, but we got back and we went and, uh, and uh, went on David Letterman and all the shows just to prove that uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats can do this. My favorite analysis was Stephen Colbert ran clips of it on his show and, and said, Jeff Flake and Martin Heinrich proved once and for all Republicans and Democrats can get along when death is the only option. <laughs> so, so, for what it's worth, we proved that empirically. So, anyway. um, we're running short on time. And so I just want to close with two final, uh, hopefully short questions. Um, is there room in our politics for a third party? And uh, a corollary to that is, uh, if so, might uh, Jeff Flake's name be, be seen as a, uh, might we see that as a standard bearer? Um, there's an old saying that uh, running as an independent is the future, and it will always be the future. <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, you have to look today, and if you think if, uh, President Trump decides to run for a second term. And if the Democrats, uh, all the energy in the Democratic Party right now is on the left, uh, the far left, either Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris. Uh, if the Democrats nominate somebody from their left and we nominate somebody who is right now on our far right, there's got to be a huge swath of voters in the middle uh, looking for something else. And uh, so I, I've always sought that time for an independent as far in the future. It may not be so far. Um, now, who that will be, we don't know. We don't know. And I, I do think that there will be a Republican challenge to the president as well. Somebody who just gets out there with probably no hope of winning, but just to remind Republicans what we used to stand for. Uh, limited government, economic freedom, free trade, pro-immigration, and, and so I, I think that you're going to see a very exciting election period uh, coming up. Uh, 
uh, where we'll be. I can't talk about it. My wife's here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let the record reflect he, uh, he deflected that question. Um, <laughs> Um, and then my final question, because you're at Georgetown University in front of a room full of a lot of aspiring public servants, um, what advice would you give to a young person who's thinking about going into public okay. service in these hyper-polarized times? If you want to tailor your answer to cons young conservatives, feel free, but, but broadly speaking. Well, first advice I would get, I tell older people, people my age, change the channel every once in a while. Please, whatever you're watching, whether it's Fox News all day or MSNBC or CNN, change the channel. It doesn't apply to you, I know. <laughs> but for you, get outside of your own news feed. Um, expose yourself to differing opinions. Understand that not everybody feels the way you do and that people uh, outside of your news feed have valid opinions that you ought to respect. And, and, uh, and, and realize that uh, this smash mouth politics, it, you know, it, it's never been as sanguine as, you know, we like to think politics, but, but right now it's particularly vitriolic. And that, I hope that fever cools at some point. But for those of you who are aspiring to, to go into public service, just realize it is a noble profession, whichever party you're in. I, I respect uh, so much uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that have very different perspectives than I do. And uh, I, I, the interns that, that come and, and uh, work with me, I was an intern once in the office that I now hold. And, and I'm grateful that, and I interned for a Democrat, Dennis Dacuzzini. I'm glad that he instilled in me the desire to serve and that with all the cynicism out there that Public service is a noble profession. Being an elected official or on a staff um, or fighting for these issues uh, with advocacy groups or, or, or in any other way is a, is a good thing. And, and uh, let's, let's find a way to push back the cynicism that exists. We have massive problems here in the country, obviously. I think our massive debt that we are passing on to our kids. It's a big problem we're gonna to have to face. Uh, but when you look at over history uh, with the Civil War and, and uh, women's suffrage and other things that we've gotten through and, and that we've found a way to be on the right side of, uh, the challenges that we face today are small by comparison. And it just takes goodwill on both sides. So. So just realize that it's a noble profession. I'm glad that there are so many here who are look, thinking about it. So. Uh, a big part of what we try to do at the Institute of Politics and Public Service is pop filter bubbles, change news feeds, right. and encourage people to understand as many different perspectives as they can. And so, Senator, I want to thank you for helping us understand yours a little bit more here tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you all. And. Um, Senator Flake's book, Conscious of a Conservative. We do have copies right outside uh, the auditorium, so if you are inclined, uh, you can pick up a copy uh, for sale uh, on your way out. So thank you all for coming. Senator, thank you. Thank you.